welcome to our Oceans Live audiences everywhere around the globe. It has been a thrilling week, but today marks the third and final day of Capitol Hill Ocean Week 2015 here at the Museum in Washington, D.C. for Capitol Hill Ocean Talk. I am your host, Kate Thompson, with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Stay tuned to OceansLive.org throughout the day to watch every session of Chow Live, including the prestigious Chow Leadership Roundtable at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Until then, you won't want to miss a minute of the latest in ocean and coastal affairs. And don't forget to join our conversation. If you have a question for our panelists, tweet us at hashtag chow2015 or chat with us at oceanslive.org and your question might be asked live. Right now, I am joined by three gentlemen whose developments in technology and new media are changing the world of marine education. In the studio, we, are, we have Lance Towers, the Director of Advanced Technology Programs for Electronic and Information Solutions for the Boeing Company. Boeing's Advanced Technology Programs business bridges maritime intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, as well as maritime acoustics and proprietary programs. Next, we have Adam Idelson, the supervising producer and one of the writers for the animated undersea adventure series Octonauts. Now in its fourth season, Octonauts premiered on Disney Channel in January 2012 and is watched in over 100 countries, including 1.5 billion viewers in China alone. And we also have Rob Burke, an executive producer for Curiosity Stream, the world's first ad-free, on-demand streaming service for quality informative, or informative programming. As an award-winning documentary producer, Rob has developed, written, and produced hundreds of hours of broadcast and online programming for providers like the Discovery Channel and National Geographic. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today in studio. I'm so excited about this topic. Uh, so before we start our discussion, however, I wanted to step away from our experienced professionals to take a look at a future wave of innovators in action. We have exciting footage from the Marine Advanced Technology Education, or MATE, regional competition at the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Watch as enthusiastic children and young adults race remotely operated vehicles, or ROVs. Let's take a look. So that regional was actually hosted at the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary up in Alpena, Michigan. Uh, but Lance, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about how cool is that? Science, technology, engineering, math, STEM. I mean, it's a big thing now, big buzz. The president is all about it. So among other degrees, you hold a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from California State Polytechnic University of Pomona. What is your reaction seeing this new wave of engineers go at it? Well, I can't be more excited uh, just because of the fact that hands-on experience is the best thing to actually translate the uh, classroom environment to the actual effort. Um, if you, you want, you know, classroom environment is important, but once you get the, uh, the chance to go out there and, and actually use your hands, put something together, put it out in an environment, see how it works in that environment, and it, that's, there's nothing more valuable. And that's the only way we are going to bridge uh, the next generation into the, the needed skill set of STEM, or you know, it's, it's the only way we're going to do it. We have to uh, bring the students to the environment. Right. So when you were in school, what inspired you to be an electrical engineer? 
Well, I was, my, I was the youngest of four kids, and I, was, I drove my parents nuts because I always <laughs> built things in my room, and then my parents had to deal with it after the fact. But I used to build my own balls with planes, and I'd yeah. fly them. I also used to take apart almost every electronic device we had at the house to see how it worked. Again, much to the chagrin of my parents. But I always found out how it worked, and then I always had that curiosity. And so even to this day, if I have to do something at my house, I don't hire a contractor. I'll typically do it myself just because I love to define the project. Mm -hmm. execute it, do it myself, and I, I just like to see the, the, the completion at the end. Well, so actually my son's the same way. <laughs> so I'm, I'm hoping engineering, <laughs> maybe I can be the, the ocean mom and push him towards ocean That'd engineering. But um, So one of the priorities of President Obama's administration is to increase the number of STEM students that we're putting out of our schools here in the United States. Why do you think it's so hard for, for kids to stay or want to go into STEM careers? I think personally it's the way we've got the education system, and it's not to, to, to uh, put that down. It's just, you know, we currently we focus on reading and writing a lot. And then they kind of treat, they take math and they kind of do in the memorization aspect. And every child develops differently. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my family all thinks I was good at math from day one. I struggled in math all the way through elementary school, middle school, and high school. And it wasn't until like my freshman year in college where it snapped, where everything clicked. And then everything made sense to me. And I was able to advance that and take that even further. But sometimes if we can figure out how to create that exciting project in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, so that they understand that science is actually fun and not just reading a book. Right. If you can bring the experiment into the class, take the kid out of the book, into the environment, you will inspire those kids. And the kids that naturally have that uh, knack for it are going are gonna to pick it up. I mean, I was with Craig McLean at the, the Ocean's Gala last Tuesday, and the 17-year-old boy walks up to us and he was talking about his research that he started when he was 12. You know, and I, I was blown away just from his passion. Right. Well, that was created by his parents, just because you listen to his background. It's the same thing. Parents need to help encourage it, and the classrooms need to be able to pull it into it so that we can see it. Nice. So what does Boeing in particular do to motivate people to join STEM fields? So right now, we are drastically increasing the amount of leveraging of internships, even from middle school and high school, really? just because of the fact that if you can bring the, the student into the actual work environment sooner rather than later, uh, that's better. And then it's also incumbent on the Boeing company and other companies to do the same thing is to provide them something meaningful to do when they get there. Not, not an assignment that you didn't want to do. You've got to bring them into it. And yeah. so, for the example, some of the uh, activities, like we have the Echo Ranger, uh, the unmanned yellow submarine uh, that <laughs> I hope nobody breaks into the song of, from Beatles, but uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the key thing there is the college hires, the new hires, right. uh, we bring them right out into the field. They're out on the surface uh, ship actually supporting the mission. So we completely cement all of that uh, field experience as soon as possible. Well, you just mentioned the Echo Ranger. Mm -hmm. uh, you've worked really closely with us in the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, and particularly the National Marine Sanctuaries. Can you tell us a little bit about the recent mission off of San Francisco that you worked with us on? Absolutely. That was a joint effort between Code Octopus, uh, the Boeing Company, and NOAA. Um, what we did is we took Cut Octopus's 3D sensor and we installed it into Echo Ranger. And Echo Ranger is an 18 foot long, about four foot on a side, autonomous underwater vehicle. Um, we went up to the Half Moon Bay up in, near San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, it was launched off of there. What we did is we programmed the vehicle mm -hmm. and the vehicle transited out to the, the location of where the USS Independence, a World War II uh, uh, aircraft carrier that was intentionally sunk in 1951. Um, they wanted to determine what was the uh, what was the state of the of the wreck, and so you program the vehicle that goes out and swims and it transited about 30 nautical miles, and then it does what's a, called a mow the lawn pattern. It just goes up one way and then comes down, just like you're mowing the lawn. And the 3D sensor is collecting um, pings from the bottom and it's storing that data within its uh, memory banks. And then the vehicle comes back and we offloaded it, and we were able to determine uh, in the joint community that the uh, aircraft carrier had rested nicely on the bottom of the ocean floor and is still in intact and it looks pretty much the same as it did in 1951. Yeah. So it's that kind of activity and the thing that was really exciting about it is that people were able to see the vehicle on the on the port. Mm -hmm. People were coming by and taking selfies with themselves and that and that started <laughs> to generate the public interest. Nice. And so the more you can pull that out to sure. the environment and get the public involved the better. Right. So there was a lot of uh, positive press, a lot more than we expected. 
It was. It was an exciting mission from what I saw. Uh, I, I want to go next time. There you go. So uh, Adam from Boeing's Yellow Submarine, the Echo Ranger, to a team of underwater animals driving yellow submarines are cups of their own. Can you tell us about Octonauts and why you call it sci-fi series for kids? Well, actually, we like to call it Star Trek meets Jacques Cousteau for kids. And the reason we call it that is that our heroes are exploring strange new worlds, but the strange new worlds are actually the zones of the ocean. And the peculiar, monstrous aliens they meet actually turned out to be real ocean creatures. Um, you know, our age group is, uh, our target age group is four to six year olds, but <clears throat> we've had success really with all age kids. And I think that's just because, uh, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. We basically, we're, we're not hiding the danger or the excitement of the ocean. We're putting it out there for everybody. Including myself. I love it. My four-year-old loves it. My almost 10-year-old loves it. And mom does too. Uh, but in the production of Octonauts, you said, you know, four to six-year-olds, you take really seriously complex science and make it understandable. Uh, so how do you take that and make it into a short story that kids can get? Well, it's not easy. Uh, it takes a team <laughs> of a lot of us. But basically, <coughs> um, we'll, we always starts with the creature or some incredible... Uh, ocean environment. You know, we, we're attracted very much to the strange but true facts that we find online or in the newspaper or perhaps on the NOAA website or occasionally uh, by cutting edge undersea technology. And, you know, we'll come into a room and we'll say, hey, have you guys seen this thing, the vampire squid? Can you believe this actually exists? And we'll look at some footage and learn some facts about it and we'll go, hey, you know, what if, uh, you know, our medic, Peso, who's kind of afraid of the ocean to begin with, has to treat this vampire squid because he, his, uh, one of his spikes is hurt. So that's sort of how a story grows, and it's really an exciting science fiction adventure story, but along the way you learn something about the ocean or a creature. Well, I, I love it because both girls and boys feel like they're engaged. You saw Tweak was the engineer, and Peso is, is, the, is the caring person on board who wants to make sure that the marine mammals that are hurt are fixed, and that's what my daughter tunes into. My son turns into, tunes into Tweak, and my daughter <laughs> turns into Peso. So it has this huge international popularity. I mean, what did we say, 1.5 billion in China alone? I mean, that's, that's crazy. So how do you take that and educate and engage with fans of the show beyond just the television screen? Well, we like to think that the Octonaut adventure always continues after the show is over. So whether that's uh, parents and kids going online and learning more about the vampire squid or about the zone of the ocean, or um, you know, playing with the toys. We have worked really hard with our toy partner, Fisher Price, to make these play sets that don't just include a cool vehicle and a hero, but they include a creature. So the kid can continue the adventure they just saw or create a new one. Um, we also have amazing partnerships with aquariums. Uh, there are, there's a live theater musical adaptation right now oh, running in, uh, <laughs> in England that's gonna come here. And there's even uh, in England now a Octonauts roller coaster oh. where you get to ride the gups <laughs> and while you're waiting online you learn all about fish and whales. Uh, there's a whale that you meet at the end of the ride. Nice. So today just happens to be Jacques Cousteau's 105th birthday. Happy birthday Jacques. Your legacy is still catching a wave today through efforts like yours. So how does it feel? I mean this this started with a book series of authors and how does it make you feel to know that your contributions are potentially Creating the next Jacques Cousteau. Well, that would be wonderful. I mean, obviously, Jacques Cousteau and Dr. Sylvia Earle and those kind of people are our heroes and our inspirations. Mm -hmm. So we started out saying, you know what? These people are action heroes. Let's make a show about them. Right. And, uh, you know, we our aim was really just to let's teach kids there's an ocean out there, it, how it affects them. Maybe they'll learn a little bit about creatures. But it has gone way beyond that. And right. we know now we've got people coming up to us, parents and kids, right. spouting all kinds of ocean facts, uh, complex facts. So I'm sure the next uh, Jacques Cousteau is out there. There's probably, probably several right. of them. Well, thank goodness for things like Netflix and streaming online because my daughter watches Octonauts over and over and over again. But so Rob, you're actually, and Lance mentioned Curiosity earlier today. So. Tell me about this really cool, what is Curiosity Stream? What, you, what are you guys doing and how is it different from cable television today? Well, Curiosity Stream is the world's first ad-free subscription video on demand service offering informational programming that educates and inspires. 
Um, we believe that the landscape, both in cable and online, uh, that there was quite a void in terms of offerings for, for uh, premium factual and informative mm -hmm. content. And so uh, we like to fill that void and create an, an online community of the uh, incurably curious. <laughs> the incurably, I love it, <laughs> love it. So what was the inspiration behind Curiosity Spring? Spring? Well, John Hendricks, uh, the founder of Discovery Communications, Discovery Channel, uh, had dreamed about creating a platform, uh, ad-free platform where people could take a deeper dive into science, mm -hmm. technology, nature, and history programming um, for decades. And uh, he retired from uh, Discovery last year and started a series of uh, retreats where they would host uh, panels of experts in various fields and um, started to record those and wanted to provide a, an opportunity for a wider audience to see them and created this platform, um, Curiosity Stream, and, and out of that we've now grown to start including um, acquired documentaries from around the world from um, premium factual providers like BBC and NHK. The, the, um, the PBS version in Japan, I guess you would say, and uh, and creating our own original content as well from those lectures. Right. So how do you? I mean, how do you compete? I mean, we, this is the day and age of reality television. So how does it? How do you tailor your services to viewers who might be tuning out because it's it's too factual, it's too informational. I need I need real. So how do you how do you get get them to be able to uh, tailor those services? Well, we, of course, we always want it to be exciting and, and uh, informative as well. So we hope that people will learn things along the way, but, yeah. but come to us because they, they yearn for that. They have that fundamental curiosity. Um, the platform itself actually is tailored so that you can explore pillars that we uh, have set up in science, technology, civilization or history, and the human spirit. And then within those, you can search topics, uh, in, in subcategories of those topics. So the user experience kind of gets tailored as you work your way through the site. And um, you can search, and for instance, if you search for a program about oceans, you might get the BBC program, um, Earth, The Power of the Planet, an episode about oceans. After watching that, just like some of the online shopping sites, you can uh, be referred or recommended programming to maybe an interview that we did with um, the NOAA administrator, Catherine Sullivan, or um, a meteorologist talking about uh, the interaction of the Earth's environment and uh, you know, atmosphere and oceans. And um, so it's a tailored experience that allows people to dive deeper and deeper and find things that interest them. So just like Octonauts, how do you come up with new ways and interesting ways to present educational material? Well, we, we actually produce a wide variety of uh, content. So we, we both acquire content from um, international programmers like BBC and HK. Uh, but then we also host these retreats and we do interviews in our studios as well, uh, Curiosity Studios, with a wide variety of experts in all those realms I mentioned earlier. Uh, and then we will take those and, and, you know, it's the things that inspire us as well and you. And, uh, and we try and identify things that people are truly curious about and find leading experts in those fields, drill down into them, uh, present them in a way that's, that's factual, exciting, uh, and informative. And um, sometimes it'll be a, a short two to three minute segment. It may be a six to ten minute mini doc, or it could be a, a full-fledged uh, hour-long documentary. So for both you uh, and Adam, it, sometimes as producers, what, what can television and new media do to increase educational value but not lose the entertainment side of things as well, or as I call edutainment? So uh, how, what are you guys doing to, to ensure that? Well, I think our platform is, is a, a big part of that. We, we really believe that it, being ad-free and being uh, freed of the traditional clock of uh, television landscape allows us the flexibility to really let the content drive it. Um, we also believe that it needs to be exciting and really, uh, you know, impassion people and inspire people um, to follow their curiosity and, uh, and hopefully they long something, you know, learn something along the way. So we want to make it exciting first and, and again, entertaining. Yeah, I mean, we really believe and we know in our hearts that kids learn best when they're excited and they're entertained and you don't have to, you know, have somebody turn to the camera by a blackboard and explain the facts slowly. Uh, you know, sometimes our scientist, uh, Shellington, is explaining the properties of a great white shark while he's being chased by one, <laughs> or, uh, or while the crew is desperately trying to save the shark and the shark doesn't know that it's hurt. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if you can give that information out during the most exciting part of the story, that's often the way a kid will remember it best. And we also do this thing uh, at the end of every episode called The Creature Report, uh, which is basically a musical segment, very catchy, that 
kids uh, remember, and we sort of recap in rhyming couplets, which are uh, quite a pain to write, but uh, very <laughs> successful in getting kids to remember the facts, we call them octofacts, that they learned during the episode. So, uh, you know, that's a, a minute long piece at the end of every episode. And it's my daughter's favorite part, creature report. <laughs> Creature report, creature report. <laughs> so from actual yellow submarines to animated ones, the worlds of technology, television, and new media represented today showcase the potential to innovate how we learn about our ocean. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for Thank sharing you. with Thank us you. all the cool things you, you have going on. Uh, so tune into the lunch session of Capitol Hill Ocean Talk at 12.15 p.m. for a full discussion on coalitions rising. The Emergence of Community Advocacy. All week at Chow, the importance of coalitions has been emphasized consistently. This afternoon, we'll explore the subjects of coalition and coalition building in depth. Please refer to the Ocean's Live schedule immediately following this broadcast for program details. And as the Octonauts would say, until the next adventure. I'm Kate Thompson, and thank you for watching. Calling all Octonauts. Quasi. Hey, sir. Charlton. Dushi. Anything. Wait. <clears throat> Quasi, activate Creature Report. Creature Report. Creature Report. Creature Report. Ah, whale sharks are definitely check, check, check. the biggest fish in all the sea. Check, check. They open up their mouths really wide Creature Report. Creature Report. and eat whatever swims inside. Creature Report. Creature Report. Though their mouths are oh so huge. Check, check. Whale sharks all like to eat teeny tiny food. Shots break! Go whale sharks! Go whale sharks! Go whale sharks! Creature report! Creature report! Creature report! We're done with our mission! Octonauts at ease! Until the next adventure!